Hi, my name is Philip Witte, and I'm a research scientist at Microsoft Research for Industry. Uh, today, I'll present our work towards enabling the clusterless supercomputer. Uh, and as part of this project, we have developed Redwood, which is a framework for distributed programming in the Julia language uh, on Azure. Microsoft Research for Industry is a team that has been recently formed in Microsoft, uh, and that, that is trying to bridge the gap between Microsoft Research and the various commercial industries that are operating on Azure. Uh, the idea is to bring cutting edge research from Microsoft Research uh, to solve various industry problems in, uh, for example, the retail sector, financial services, uh, in energy, in agriculture, and in media and entertainment. The topic of this talk is to address the challenges of running HPC workloads in the cloud. Uh, when we think about this, there are two main challenges that we have identified. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Users who want to run HPC workloads in the cloud basically have to act as a um, HPC administrator now because they have to go and uh, set up an HPC cluster in the cloud, uh, which can be very challenging for people who just want to run an application. Uh, the, the second part that we have identified is in that in order to have scalable and resilient HPC, uh, you have to have very different uh, multiple components that have to interact. So you have to have the right HPC hardware, you have to have the right HPC architecture, what kind of cluster setup, what kind of file systems, what kind of networking. And then on top of that, you have to build your HPC application. Um, and your HPC application in the end really is only as good as the weakest link. So even if you have, for example, a very scalable elastic HPC architecture that can handle nodes failing, um, that might not actually help you if you have an HPC application that's, for example, built on top of MPI, uh, which cannot necessarily handle instances uh, crashing or being restarted. Of course, pretty much all cloud providers provide some kind of services that, in principle, make it easier to set up an HPC cluster in the cloud. Um, but even with these services, you still have to make a lot of decisions regarding the HPC hardware and the HPC architecture. Uh, so you have to think about all these things that uh, we listed here on the right. Uh, I mean, on top of that, there's also the aspects that you actually have to think about how do I set all this stuff up? Uh, do I go to the browser and is there some kind of graphical user interface or am I using some kind of API that lets me define all these things? And then I have to go and read the API documentation, which might already be in itself a couple hundreds of pages. Uh, so we're thinking about how can we make that HPC type experience in the cloud easier for users? And of course, there's amazing services like Julia Hub that make that in principle easier. But we even want to go a step beyond that and think about, do we, from the user perspective, even really want to think in terms of a cluster? Or can we somehow come up with a way how we can directly run code in the cloud without thinking about all this stuff? So this brings us to the idea of serverless computing, which has really kind of taken off over the last couple of years. So the idea of serverless computing is that uh, users can write some code, for example, some Python code, and then they just upload that code to the cloud. And then that code is run in response to some trigger, for example, you uploading some file to the cloud. Um, and there are a couple of different services on all the cloud platforms that provide this, for example, AWS Lambda or Azure Functions. Uh, so the idea is really that the user doesn't do any infrastructure management um, and only focuses on the application. But of course, the big limitation is that this doesn't really work for HPC because there's like a limited execution time, there's no network connection, um, all these kinds of restrictions. So the question that we want to ask is, can we build something similar for HPC where we have basically all the advantages of the serverless model, but none of the restrictions and can actually run very large scale application on any type of cloud VMs? So a lot of the current research in this area focuses really on building application frameworks on top of the serverless function frameworks like AWS Lambda. And because of these restrictions, like very short runtime, limited memory, no networking, you have to build extra frameworks on top of that. They basically take your application and then uh, represent it as a directed acyclical graph. And then you kind of break up your program into tiny little portions that you can execute through Lambda. Um, but there's like a lot of heavy lifting you have to do because you have to split your program, you have to keep track of the program state, you have to do all these queues and different executions. And because your Lambda functions can't talk to each other directly, they indirectly talk through, for example, object storage. So we see this current approach to serverless computing in the cloud as really only one possible approach to pave the way to the serverless supercomputer. Uh, 
So as we said, right now you have a lot of these frameworks built on top of AWS Lambda or Azure functions that kind of try to circumvent these service limits. And if you wouldn't have these service limits, like limited runtime, these frameworks would look very different. So they're very specific to that. And we more want to think about a second approach that is focused around the user experience. How does the user interact with the cloud? How do I run code in the cloud? How can I take advantage of this idea of serverless? But it doesn't necessarily have to be on top of something like AWS Lambda. It could really just be on top of any generic cloud service. Because oftentimes these cloud services will change over the time. So we think there's not really a point to necessarily having something very specific to something like AWS Lambda, but rather think about, okay, from the user level experience, what should this serverless supercomputing look like? And we kind of want to focus on that. And as a first step in that direction, we built a distributed programming framework in the Julia language for this idea of clusterless supercomputing. Uh, and this framework is called a Redwood and was developed by our research for industry team over the last, uh, last couple of months. Um, and that specific uh, framework is not built on top of uh, serverless functions, but it's built on top of batch computing service. Uh, in this case, Azure Batch, but there's a similar service on AWS too. Um, and really what we're going to want to move towards is to think about the cloud as more of a language extension rather than something that you interact with through, say, a third-party API. So to get a sense of what Redwood is and what it does, we'll take a step back first and look at the conventional distributor program in Julia. So as we said uh, before, what you have to do is, first of all, you have to set up some kind of parallel cluster that has a couple of workers that are connected uh, to a master. And then you have to write your distributor program, which in Julia uses these macros like at everywhere and at spawn, for example, to remotely execute a function. Uh, with Redwood, we have actually similar macros that have the same functionality. So you can define a function or you can remotely execute a function. But in this case, you don't have a cluster with workers that are connected to your master, but instead you have a pool of loosely uh, connected workers. Uh, and then you have a cloud service that's sitting in between the master or your computer that's running the main program and the workers. So when you remotely execute a function, that function is then uh, sent to a cloud service, in this case, Azure Batch, which then takes care of distributing and executing this workload. From our perspective, this kind of architecture has a couple of advantages. First of all, it's highly scalable. So conventionally, you have uh, in a cluster setting, all the worker nodes are connected to the master. So the master quickly becomes the communication bottleneck. In this kind of architecture, the master or a main application is, is decoupled from uh, the different workers and the pools of workers. So you can scale all these components individually because the workers don't never directly talk to the master or the main application. So you can increase the, the number of workers in individual pools. You can increase the number of pools. These pools can even be in different data centers or regions. And uh, as you scale out, your master doesn't have to communicate with all these workers because the master only communicates to the cloud service. And then the cloud service actually takes care of distributing your workload. Uh, it also takes care of resilient, for example, if one of the worker nodes dies, uh, it's not the responsibility of the user uh, to respawn that instance. So now we'll look a little bit closer of how this actually works. So the first step is you have to uh, spin up the pool. So for the pool, you have a parameter file where you specify, for example, what kind of instances do you want to use? How many pools do you want to use? How many workers per pool? Should these workers be connected? And there's a bunch of different parameters uh, that all also have default values. Uh, so then for, as a user, you uh, create that pool and then that pool is spun up and managed by the cloud service. So at this point, the user doesn't have to take manage this pool anymore. And then it's uh, like a conventional distributed program in Julia. You can uh, do a function definition with this batch def macro, and then you can remotely execute a function uh, through this at batch exec macro. And what happens then is that basically uh, Redwood cr creates a closure around this function and then execute it remotely through Azure Batch. So it, it uploads the code and all the variables automatically to Azure Batch and then runs uh, this function as a batch task in the pool. And that is all managed by the cloud service. So like I said, the biggest difference between Redwood and conventional distributor programming is that your main application is not directly connected to your workers. Um, so this is why we have our own macros for distributed programming. Uh, and what happens when you call this add batch dev macro is that Redwood collects the abstract syntax trees of this function uh, that is tagged through this macro. Uh, 
Uh, and then when you execute this function and remotely uh, with the add batch exact macro, uh, Redwood takes a, creates a closure around this function. So basically takes, takes a snapshot uh, of the current state, including all the input variables. So now you can run this function in a different context. Uh, that's not your current Julia session. So uh, when you run this add batch exact macro, you collect the abstract syntax trees and the variables, you upload it to the cloud, and then it gets executed through uh, the cloud service on one of the workers in the pool. And we want to keep the user API as close to the original Julia distributed programming uh, framework as possible so that it's a really seamless um, experience for the user to switch from one uh, distributed programming model to the other. So we have, uh, like I said, uh, macros that are uh, equivalent to the add everywhere macro, to the spawn macro, uh, and then we have a couple of additional ones such as broadcasting, for example. Uh, and then the uh, fetching the output works similar as well. So in conventional distributed Julia, you get a remote reference to a result that's sitting on one of the workers. And in case of Redwood, the result is written to cloud storage. And then uh, the re user receives a reference to that object in uh, the cloud object store. And then you can call the fetch function on this uh, remote reference, and that copies the output back to the user. So by designing these macros that we have in Redwood, very similar to the distributed programming macros that Julia already provides, we want to make it very simple for the user to transition between um, a conventional Julia program that runs in a cluster to a Julia program that runs in this clusterless fashion in the cloud. And what I want to emphasize here is that we want to think about the cloud really as a language extension and not as like a third party API that we have to manually call. So just as a comparison here, I'm showing the code that it would take to run a Hello World style example with Azure Batch using the conventional uh, Python SDK. So that takes a lot of code because you have to define all these things individually, like uh, creating a job, well, how do I run it, how do I upload the code and all these things. Whereas uh, with our macros, that is just handled automatically. So you can write code that looks exactly like conventional Julia code, but does all these things under the hood automatically through code generation. So the cool thing about Redwood is that it really opens the door for new distributed programming scenarios. Uh, and to understand that better, we'll just, for example, first look at the very simple base case where we have a single pool of workers and the workers are maybe not connected to each other. So like I showed before, what you can do is you can define a function that I want to execute remotely, like this hello world function. And then I, I remotely execute this function through add batch exec on either a single workers or on multiple workers by combining it with a PMAP function. Um, so then this function gets executed on each worker individually, and the result is written to the cloud object store, and then the user uh, can, for example, get that output back and apply a reduction operation like summation to it. Um, so one of the examples we ran is we run in parallel a, a wave simulation code uh, from the Julia DeVita inversion framework. But now you can also do more complicated uh, scenarios. For example, instead of having a pool of independent workers where you just execute some type of batch workload, you could have multiple pools and the workers within each pool are connected. So now what you can do is you can run multiple MPI workloads in each of these individual pools. And that is very simple to set up in Julia. So here what we have is just a hello world function and that hello world function itself is a parallel MPI function. So it uh, creates the MPI um, environment here and then does some parallel computations. Here's just a hello world example. And now I can actually take this function, this MPI function and execute it uh, three times on my three different pools. So really what that allows you to do is uh, to combine data and model parallelism because you can use this add batch exec p map to parallelize uh, over the data, basically because all these uh, functions are processed independently in separate pools. But then within each individual pool, you can uh, implement model parallel algorithms where you have closer communication, for example, through MPI. And then yet another scenario would be to implement nested levels of data parallelism. So maybe you don't want to run an MPI type of workload within each pool, but then what you could do is you could have a PMAP function that runs in each of these individual pools. So here we have a simple hello world function and then a say hello function, which runs a PMAP function over four workers. And now I can execute this function uh, with Redwood on in the three individual pools. So now in each individual pool, 
you have a function that calls a PMAP function over the four workers. Uh, so kind of what that, that does is that it controls more of the data movement because now the master in each individual pool collects the output from the workers and then only one worker from each pool writes the output to op cloud object store. So now you kind of minimize the data movement a little bit uh, in the amount of data that you write to object storage. So in the next section, we'll look at some example and applications, but we'll first start off with a very simple tutorial of how to use Redwood. To start off with Redwood, uh, I need two simple files. First of all, I have my parameter file, which specifies, uh, for example, the name of the pool, how many pools do I want, what kind of instances do I want in the pool, and how many workers per pool. Uh, and then the second file that I need is my pool startup script which specifies what kind of software needs to be installed on the, on, the, on the pool. So in this case, it's Julia and then any user packages you can add here. So now I'm gonna start a Julia session. And then first of all, set the environment variable to my parameter file. Um, next, I'm gonna load the package, um, which I actually wasn't allowed to call Redwood. So in the uh, open source software release, it's called the actual package is called Azure Cluster HPC. So next I create the pool and hand over that resource file uh, that pool startup script, I mean, that specifies what kind of software needs to be installed on the workers uh, in the pool. So now here, I already started that pool, so you don't have to wait until it starts up, but it's just a pool with two workers. Um, then next, I'm gonna define one of the hello world functions using the batch dev macro. So now this function, I can just execute that on my local Julia session uh, as always. Um, so I can do that, use that for testing purposes. And then once I have tested my function and I want to execute it remotely, I can use this add batch exec macro and run it through Azure Batch. So now if I go to this jobs tab, I can see um, that my function had been submitted as a batch job to Azure and has been executed. Uh, and I see the output here. So now if I want to run this function in parallel, in multiple uh, instances in parallel, what I can do is I run this add batch exec macro in combination with the PMAP function. Um, so now if I go back to the Batch Explorer and look at the Jobs tab, um, I can see that there's a second job that now has two tasks. Uh, so it executed this function in parallel. And then uh, the return argument is what's called a batch controller uh, that has uh, references to the output. So if I call the fetch function on this output, I get the function return arguments back. And in the end, I can call the destroy function to delete the pool and clean up the resources. In the next example, we'll consider a slightly more interesting scenario. So here we'll look at a seismic imaging and inversion example, which involves minimizing this kind of objective function, which is essentially a data misfit between seismic data that I collect in an experiment and data that I numerically model in my computer by solving wave equations uh, of how waves should propagate in the subsurface. Um, there are two different open source frameworks that we have tried out. Uh, in one of the earlier slides, I showed some examples with the Judy DV2 inversion framework. And in the next example, we'll run the Chevron optimization framework for imaging and inversion, or short Kofi. Uh, we'll run this package with Redwood. So what I did for this example is I went to the original Kofi repository and I took one of the example Jupyter notebooks uh, that runs on a conventional distributed Julia cluster, for example, on Azure. And then I modified their example uh, to run it with Redwood. And I'll walk kind of through the steps of what I need to do to do this. Uh, and the original notebook is linked up there. So as before, like I said, I have this parameter setup file where I specify the cluster. In this case, how many nodes do I want to use? Uh, how many pools? Um, and some basic names. Um, then I also have to provide a credential file that has uh, the credentials to my batch and my storage account. If, I don't, if you don't have those storage accounts, we also provide scripts to automatically generate those. Uh, so then again, as before, you have to set the parameter that point to these files and then load the package. Here I'm starting a pool uh, 
not from scratch where I installed all the software on it, but I started a pool with a predefined VM image that already has all the software installed on it. Uh, the next in the notebook, I'm just loading the velocity and reflectivity models that I knew, used to model the wave propagation in the subsurface and to generate my seismic data. And by the way, the most, really everything I show in this notebook is from the original notebook. And there are only a few things that I changed that I'll point out now. Uh, one of them being everywhere where I had at everywhere in the original notebook, I changed this to our add batch dev macro. And that's really the only thing I needed to change here. Um, so yeah, so here I use that bad def macro to load packages and then also do all the function definitions. And then uh, the other thing I have to change once I want to actually execute my function remotely, uh, the original notebook has only this pmap function um, and here I have to change it and add the batch exact macro in front of the pmap function. Uh, the reason I needed to do this here is because I really needed also a macro that works on the pmap function, not just the function itself. Uh, so here, as an example, I'm running this pmap function now, and I run a fairly large workload on 350 uh, workers. So I have my pool here, and as I refresh, I can see that my job has been submitted, and 350 tasks are now running in parallel. And then once I'm done, I'm fetching the result and applying a reduction operation to it. Uh, so all the workers compute basically a seismic image, and then send that image back to my master worker. And now it collects all these different images from different perspectives, essentially, and then sums them into a simple image. So here we have the original input data. I have 350 different ones of these so-called seismic chop records. And I compute a seismic image for each one of them and then sum them all into this final image, as you see here. And then at the end, again, I call my destroy function to clean up all the resources uh, and delete the pool. Redwood was really designed from the ground up with scalability always in mind. And because you have this detachment of the master worker from uh, the rest of the workers, it's actually very easy to scale up to a large number of nodes. So the previous example with the Chevron code that I just showed you, I was able to scale that up out of the box without any modifications to over 4,000 VMs. So all I have to change is in my setup parameter file, I have to specify, okay, I wanna use 16 pools now, and I want to use 256 nodes per pool. So that gives me over 4,000 VMs, and I'm able to run the same code that, again, your Jupyter notebook, that could run on your laptop if you wanted to, or in a single cloud VM. But then you can, you're can you able to execute parallel tasks on all these nodes. Um, and on the right-hand side here, I'm plotting how long it actually took to spin up that pool. And you see that it kind of happens in stages. So after five minutes, uh, 15 hundreds of the instances are ready and then after maybe 12 minutes the rest of the instances and then of course you always have a couple of stragglers and those stragglers are managed by redwood or by the the cloud platform as well and then if you have any tasks that fail uh, you can either say you want to retry a failed task and if you have stragglers you can define for example a timeout and say after that timeout restart the task or just abandon the task so for the last example we want to consider a little bit a different scenario so in the previous examples, we basically have a scenario where I have an application that's running on, say, my laptop, and that has a parallel section that I want to execute uh, remotely through Redwood. But there's also maybe a different scenario where, for example, um, you just want to run a, a code or a program on your local machine, and then there's one section of that code that you want to execute remotely, for example, because you want to access specialized hardware. So machine learning would obviously be an application that comes to mind here. Because in machine learning, what you usually do, you have some kind of workflow where uh, you're developing a machine learning or a neural network on your local machine. You prepare the data, you look at the data, you play with the data, do some transformations, and then you test your network. And that typically happens just on a CPU because you don't need a GPU for that. There's no heavy computations. Um, but once you've done your setup, now where you go to the stage where you actually want to train your network, you have to move everything over to a GPU machine. So you have to copy your data over, uh, upload your code to Git, then pull it onto the GPU machine, and then train your network. And then once you're done with that, you either do the validation, testing, parameter tuning, you either do that on the GPU machine or you go back to your CPU machine. Um, of course, you can also do all these steps just on the GPU machine. But if this is, for example, a GPU machine that you're renting in the cloud, you're wasting a lot of money because the first and the last step don't actually require a GPU and you're only really using the GPU in the center part here. Um, so if you use, you're sitting on the GPU machine to do your development, 
then you're wasting a lot of money. So this is where Redwood comes in because Redwood allows you to do all this development um, on your local computer, which could be a CPU machine. But then when you actually want to train your model, you could just simply define a function, a training function, and remotely execute that function on a GPU machine on Azure. But you don't have to manually copy your data or your code over because you can simply tag a function and then say, okay, execute this train training function in the cloud and then just give me the results back. And it's easy to do this process iteratively in this fashion because there's no manual going back and forth. So here I will show an example of how to actually do that using the Flux machine learning package. Um, as before, we kind of start with defining our parameter file and then loading the package. Then in the next step, we create our pool which has a single GPU machine. And the pool could even be empty at the beginning and then you enable auto scaling and only add the GPU once you actually submit a task. So next I load the flex, flex package uh, using the add batch dev macro. And then I just define this very simple network with two layers and a softmax function. Then I have my loss function, which is just uh, sum of uh, square differences and then uh, create a little random training data set. So next I define my training function uh, that trains the model and takes as the input arguments the, the data and the training label as well as your network and a flag if you want to use GPU or not. And then it just has a simple optimization loop for uh, training the network. So now if I want to test this network and train it locally, I can just execute that function without any macros and then it runs on my machine. And once I'm done with the testing and I want to actually train the network on a GPU, I can now use the add batch exact macro to run this training function remotely through Azure Batch um, and if I pass the CUDA flag equal to true, then it will run this on a GPU. And once I'm done, I can call a fetch function to get my trained model back. And at the end, I clean up the resources. So as I mentioned earlier, the official Redwood repository uh, and Julia package is actually called Azure Clusterless HPC. Um, and it's an open source repository that's on the official Microsoft uh, GitHub website. And it's published under MIT license. And we would really love to have people from the community try it out, give us some feedback, or you can fork it, you can create your own um, version of this. Uh, if you maybe not on Azure, you're on AWS, then I mean, in principle, it should be possible to also develop a different backend um, that's not Azure, but a different cloud like uh, Google or, or AWS. So that should be in principle possible as well. Uh, so yeah, we would love to have people try this out, give us some feedback. Um, try it out for your application, say if you're successful or not, or uh, what we could do to improve this. And then the next steps that we have in mind would be to extend this to potentially different backend services. As I explained in the beginning, we don't necessarily want to tie this to one specific cloud service like serverless functions, but have different backend services under the hood. So right now we started with Azure Batch, but we could think about different services that are maybe somewhat equivalent like uh, Kubernetes, or we could even have a serverless functions as a backend, which would make sense. For example, if you have a, a Julia function that is very short running, then you don't really wanna wait for a batch pool to spawn up, which might take a couple of minutes, and then you run a function that maybe only runs for 10 seconds. So in that case, it might make sense to have additional macros that would also allow you to execute shorter running functions as serverless functions. And then uh, after that, we're also thinking about how we can enable automatic resource selection. Because right now, you still have to provide this parameter file and say what kind of instances you want, um, how many, and how, what should the pool size be. But in principle, these are also somewhat difficult to choose and always pick the optimal instance for every application. So if there would be some way to either automate this or automatically adjust this while you're running your program. So for example, you could have some detection mechanism that sees that you're only using 30% of your memory. So halfway through you running your program, it will switch out the underlying pools and attach different type of instances that were cheaper for the user. So thank you so much for watching this presentation. Um, I really appreciate it. And again, I'm sharing the link here to our open source repository. Please try it out if you get a chance. Uh, we would love for people to, to try this out and practice and see, see how it works for your application. Thanks so much.